Hey there YouTube, I'm Ikitsu to the Ikitsu Times, welcome to my channel, welcome to a little bit of Battlefleet Gothic. So I was on a temporary hiatus just because I had some real life stuff that was coming up there and uh, stopping me from making videos for a little while, but uh, we're back and we're going to be talking about something that's kind of in hiatus as well, and that's Battlefleet Gothic. So I wanted to make this video for very, very new players and sort of go through the extreme basics about things that are probably happening to you that are making it so that you're not necessarily winning battles, and it's kind of difficult to tell what's going on, and it's a little bit frustrating if you're not sort of acclimatized to the game. Very easy to lose battles when you don't know what's going on very well. So uh, the way that this game works is you basically just pit your ships against your opponent's fleet and you and whichever fleet does more damage to the other is usually going to win. But there's a couple things you need to consider when dealing that damage. For example, uh, I've got the Cessia ship here, and it looks on paper like it is a decent ship, but it also looks like it's identical to the Borkan, which has the same sort of damage per second coming out of it. Uh, this is where the points value becomes very important to look at. We've got 175 for the Borkan, you got the Daylith at 179 and 102 for the Sassia. Now, this is something that you'll figure out for your first match pretty quickly, but it takes um, 250 points to start a match here uh, at a first level fleet. And that means that you can take two Sassias, but you cannot take two of the other ones. So you want to assemble yourself a 250 point fleet that is going to have as much punch as possible. Now. What do those other ships get as compensation for this? Well, the uh, Borkan gets the uh, two uh, Wardens, as does the Dalith, and the Dalith also has the Ordnance Launch Bay rather than Torpedoes, Torpedoes being a little bit inferior under normal circumstances to an Ordnance Launch Bay. So, okay, we now know that if we want to have a 250-point fleet, um, I could take one of these ships, which would instantly come with two Wardens, and now two Wardens have a total damage per second of six which is pretty good. And this comes down to a total of 175 points. That's a little bit cheaper than two Sasias, but uh, it means that I could take one Borkan and I could take a Castellan as well. So I would end up with more firepower in total. This guy's got a lovely um, one damage per second there and another two here. So for another three points of damage, uh, or you can take two messengers, which have a total of like one point of damage per second. So not really that great either. But um, so for argument's sake that you, you take the uh, Borkhen and you take a Castellan and that's going to be 100, 130 points. I think it's 130 points, um, which gives you um, a little bit more damage per second than two emissaries. And in fact, equal damage per second to two Sessias and a single messenger, which is the equivalent that you would get on that side. So a lot of people make the sort of mistaken impression um, that it's a good idea to have lots of these Wardens because they're a powerful ship, they've got good weapons there, the Iron Cannon turrets are quite powerful, good weapon to have. The problem is that these are on a vulnerable, vulnerable chassis. They've got 100 hull integrity and 100 shield, which means that they're very easy to destroy. So while you do have the same damage per second in both example fleets, the Castellan 2 Warden and single uh, Borkan fleet, uh, you're going to run into the sort of problem where the uh, Wardens are getting exploded very quickly, and because of this, I don't really recommend taking them. If you've got very fragile ships, then the fact that you've got equal firepower means that your firepower is going to diminish much more quickly. So unless you've got an overwhelming advantage in firepower by taking lots of escorts, I wouldn't recommend it. So you always want to sort of take a scratch pad and figure out what exactly you're getting um, if you're taking one fleet composition over another. And this is why I've got three of the Sassias. The same principle applies to all fleets. If I was playing as the Imperial Navy, I would want to take three light cruisers here, and I would go into a battle with two light cruisers, a two Dauntlesses if I was playing against another person, and then as many escort ships as could fill out because I'm not allowed to take three Dauntless light cruisers in a 250 point battle. Um, just because of points considerations. So it's it's always best to fill up as much as possible on the heavier ships. The exception to this is if you're against someone who is so much higher level than you that you know you're going to lose the battle. And if that happens, what I actually recommend is you take, for example, I would take the single Emissary Cecilia here, I would hide it in the corner, I would bring a whole bunch of the Messengers and Castellans, I would run them up to my opponent to distract him for as long as I could, and then warp out with my other ship. This would get my ship some experience points, it would lose me the battle, which is fine. I don't particularly care about that. I might be lost in the warp for two turns, which is not that bad. 
um, and I would still be advancing my fleet track, I would still be advancing my ship experience, which is the important part there. It's much more important for your ships to come out of these battles alive, because if they don't survive them, they don't gain that experience points. And uh, the repairs for them is just as expensive as getting lost in the warp, and you don't get as much uh, gain. So definitely recommend if you're up against somebody who's got a much higher level than you, to simply retreat from that battle as best as you can with your ship intact. You'll be able to tell if you're against a higher level opponent because it will give you bonus points. So if you're level 1 and it says it's a 350 point battle, then you know that your opponent is giving you 100 extra points because of his higher level. And this means that his ships are going to be much more powerful than yours because of upgrades to the point where even if you did take 3 Sasias, you have a very good chance to lose simply because he's probably a much more advanced, better player than you are. So do keep that in mind, this applies to every fleet. If you're playing as Chaos, Eldar, uh, the Imperial Navy, as the Space Marines, as Tau, any of those fleets are going to want to use that strategy in those particular cases, and I highly recommend uh, getting used to it. Which is very unfortunate, I feel, because it does mean that you're sort of wasting your time on battles that just aren't that fun or that interesting, but it does mean that you're still advancing. If you really, really don't like that style of play, uh, then you could definitely try to win them. I still uh, try to win some of those, but I would wait till I was a little bit more experienced before I jumped into that. So next up, we've got to talk a little bit about how to use these ships effectively. And this is going to be down to reading the statistics of your ship and learning what these numbers mean. So one of the important things that people don't necessarily utilize enough is these armor values down here. And this is more evident for Imperial players than it is for Tau players. But um, you've got different armor values based on these different arcs. F is for forward, S is for side, B is for back. So Tau have the forward armor of 75, side armor of 50, and back 50. The forward armor of 75 means that they have a 75% chance of ignoring a hit to the front from macro weapons only. Um, now in the tabletop it should also apply to torpedoes, but in this game the torpedoes are armor penetrating. There are a few other weapons that uh, are not armor penetrating, but you know that's sort of its own thing I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, because of that it's uh, made it a lot more uh, less valuable than it was on the tabletop, but, but still. In any event, we also want to look at the firing arcs of our weapons here. So we can see that we've got 180% uh, broadside and front, so these guns can fire to the front, and three of them can fire to one side and three of them can fire to the other, is how that actually works. We've got a missile launcher that fires to the front there, and we've got two ion cannons that similarly one fires to the side, one fires to the side, and both of them can fire front. So we know that all of our damage can be fired front, so we know that our front facing damage per second can be calculated here. Uh, we've got each of these twin heavy railgun batteries. Now each of these fires twice at 4 damage every 8 seconds, or 1 damage per second in total. So we know that 6 of these have 6 damage per second, ion cannons have 2 damage per second, because there's 2 of them, and the torpedoes are 3 damage per second as well. So each of these weapons, all firing forward, gives us a grand total of 11, 11 damage per second. Okay, so if I'm firing to one side here, however, it gets reduced to 4. If I fire from this side here, it gets reduced to 4. And this applies to other ships as well. If you're talking about the Dauntless Light Cruiser with the Imperial Navy, uh, you're looking at something like, I think, 4 damage per second from the laser to the front, or 4 damage from the, or it's 3 damage for, for, for the laser and 4 damage for the torpedoes or their broadsides deal uh, 6 damage per second and their other broadside to 6 damage per second and the turrets in any direction deal 4. So um, if you're looking to maximize the amount of damage that they do, uh, you would cal calculate that sort of out. Now, uh, you also want to consider what weapons are firing because that actually makes a big difference. That's the reason that the Dauntless on front firing behavior is actually more dangerous in most circumstances than side firing behavior, um, but that's a slightly more advanced video. What you need to just look at is which firing arc has the most firepower and which direction you've got the best armor in, and then you need to decide whether or not you're going to want to unleash more firepower or have more defense in that direction, and that's going to be how you maneuver your ship. There are plenty of times, I think, where newer players are uncertain as to why they're taking so much more damage than their opponent. It's probably because they're getting hit on somewhere that is unarmored, like, say, uh, an orc fleet getting shot from behind or something like that. And, of course, there's also people who are going to have their guns facing slightly in the wrong direction, and they're going to be suffering quite a lot because of that. So, simply, Tau are very simple because of this. You just have your ship facing in the direction of your opponent fleet, and you're probably going to be fine. The next thing you'll want to consider thinking about is um, what abilities you're going to want. 
for me, I like durability abilities. So I do have the uh, repair drones here for two of my ships that I've already brought into battle. And I've also got an auger probe just as an option if I feel like I want to have a vision against my opponent there. The ability that I've taken for my level up is adaptive, uh, adaptive deflectors. That's not really something you need to worry about, but uh, that is something that really emphasizes the strength of the Tau fleet already. So something that you might want to think about. Now, what I recommend if you want to get into this game is to go through every single fleet and sort of look at what they have just in a very brief way for two reasons. One, this will let you know what they have. And when you know what your opponent has, that makes it so that uh, you can counteract them a little bit more effectively. For example, knowing the range values on the Chaos ships is going to let you realize that they've got really long range weapons. Um, and they're going to often try to utilize those extremely long range weapons, or they're going to utilize that ordnance that they've got, or anything of that sort. That's going to be their advantage against a lot of people. Their fast speed is going to be something that they utilize. And like I've already gone over all these statistics in my other uh, Battlefleet Gothic videos. Highly recommend that you check them out if you want to look at each individual fleet a little bit more closely. But that's going to be something that you definitely want to look into. So we're going to go ahead and hit the uh, search button here. The other reason that you want to look at each individual faction very carefully is because it gives you a good idea as to which faction you're going to want to play. Um, personally, I actually like playing all the different factions. Um, I play on ranked with Space Marines actually quite a bit, but uh, that's only because Tau got, or sorry, the Eldar got nerfed into Oblivion <laughs> to the point where it's kind of not fun to actually play them anymore. But uh, yeah, yeah, so it. If you sort of read through all of their abilities, all their traits, and all their different weapon systems, it's going to give you a better idea, not only how to counter them, but also whether or not you would want to play them yourselves. Alright, so I think that that's going to be enough of me talking about uh, how to sort of do this. We'll get into the battle and I'll show you sort of very, very basic battle strategies and how to sort of properly utilize them when we get a match, which might take a little while, because like I said, this game is also kind of in hiatus. Alright, so we find ourselves in a battle against the Eldar, which is annoying, but um, that is pretty much all, because they're no longer dangerous. So, you know, whatever. Let's go ahead and put down our ships here. Now, you want to keep your ships relatively close to get together for a standard cruiser clash, and this is because otherwise you're going to have your ships basically torn apart individually, so you want to keep them relatively close together. I'm just going to automate all of my abilities here the Brace for Impact, the Heavy Seeker Missiles, the Boarding Actions, and the Repair Drones all might as well be on Automatic, and this should be for a lot of your abilities regardless. Now, once you're in a more advanced state, it's a good idea to start moving those to Manual, and uh, you'll have certain situations where you definitely want them to be Manual, but even when I'm playing Ranked, and even when I'm sort of clawing my way up against pretty good Long opponents, I typically find it unnecessary end. to use manual casting for a lot of these abilities. In fact, when I want to manually use these, I like turning them off and then waiting until I'm in range to use it and then right clicking. Um, and this means that I'll cast it as soon as I sort of have that sort of situation. The exception, of course, is if you want to do something like run silently, obviously you have to click for that. There's no sort of automatic for that. But this just lets me sort of get at my opponent in a way that sort of... Uh, Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna use lock on target for Eldar. Um, this basically just lets me sort of use these abilities much more rapidly, much more easily, and with a lot less effort. Um, and this lets me sort of focus more on positioning. It lets me focus on my uh, sort of looking at where my opponent is probably going to be and figuring out what my opponent's ships are. Now, against the Eldar, they do have much much faster speed than our ships. It is kind of ridiculous actually how much a Eldar ship can move compared to us, but that is fine. Um, because we do outgun them. Now my opponent has slipped into a sort of um, stealth mode. Don't panic. Uh, we can just sit here in this cloud here until it wears off. At which point uh, we'll have our special order and he won't. So that works out quite well for us. Against the Eldar we're of course going to want to be at 3k range rather than the long range. How may I serve the tower? Eh. Might want to pop out just a little bit here but. They are cast ready for order. Basically, just want to wait till his uh, stealth runs out. Now, if he's using his stealth to get somewhere Gravity weird, then... Engaged. Oh, there he is. Okay, we know where he is. Let's go ahead and... Get out there. We serve the 
Alright, we're gonna do this. I'm not recommending you necessarily do that. It's kind of complex, actually, but... It's not super complex or anything, but it is a little bit complex. Alright, so... Here my opponent really didn't get into the optimal sort of combat range for Eldar against me, and because of this, he got wrecked pretty hard. And I was also using the ship's advantages that I had against him um, pretty effectively, so that was a very, very sort of decisive thing. Uh, stealth, in this case, doesn't matter that much. It's if you get spotted that it matters, but my opponent thought that, you know, I'll just sneak up to him, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you do that, it leaves you vulnerable for when you actually start fighting. So that's the more important part as opposed to sneaking around the battlefield. You're typically going to want whatever ability is going to give you the best direct engagement abilities. Unless you're going for something a little bit sort of more obscure, like there are some Zeech builds that I have uh, that I enjoy using that are focused around stealth, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend them for a new player necessarily. Alright, let's go ahead and hit, hit, hit continue there. So, what went wrong for my opponent there? Well, he was using two ships that don't necessarily engage that well against my Tau ships. Uh, they could have dealt some pretty okay damage if they were able to use their carrier capacity for a long period of time, but that carrier capacity has to be something he uses where I'm not in his range on a very consistent basis. If I'm able to hit him, then something's gone horribly wrong. He needed to save his sort of uh, stealth ability so that he could get in, deploy his fighters, um, and as soon as his fighters are deployed, he has to keep in range so that his fighters are going to do their bombing runs. Because if he loses sight of me, um, they're going to go away. Uh, like, you have to have sight to your target the entire time you're, you're using bombers. Otherwise, you lose the ability to do the bombing run. So that didn't work out very well for my opponent. The next thing is he sort of boosted into my ships. He should have definitely turned around and sort of boogied the other way uh, once my ships saw him. And, of course, uh, he had the wrong ability sets, I think. Um, I definitely don't think that that, uh, that stasis bomb necessarily is a really great idea against the uh, sort of tower ships, because I can just boost out of them. It's not necessarily too, too hard for me to do that. And if I'm able to do that, then he really has no hope. I think that one of them should have had a vision thing. A stasis bomb on the other one would have been fine. That way, if he drops vision on one of my ships, he could have uh, definitely hammered my ship with bombers much, much more freely while at long range, and then hit stealth, because he'd have to see me to attach the uh, spotter, and once it's on there, uh, he like to get that on there, he has to deal enough damage to take out my shields, which would have been hard to begin with, um, but if he manages to do that, that would have helped him out quite a lot. So what did I do right? Well, I knew what my engagement strategy against Eldar is. You want to be firing your front weapons against them, grinding away at their ships uh, very, very effectively because the railguns are very good at that. And I knew that his ships were going to have a harder time dealing with the front armor of my ships because he did have to chip away that to get a really good lock on my ships. I know that carrier fleets, um, if they don't attack the um, shields of a ship and then attach a recon beacon onto it, then they're not going to have a very easy time winning the fight. That strategy uh, for carrier fleets is definitely strip shields, attach beacon, and then you just uh, move away in stealth, and then you'll get free bombardment runs for the rest of the game. Um, the other thing that I did that was quite good is I had the messenger between these. It allows me to have both my ships with a good uh, turret defense. This means that the bombing runs would be even less effective. And if my opponent had used pulsars instead of those uh, bombers, he would have had to still chip through the, all the armor, uh, but he would have had a much easier time, I think, in that particular setup there, because uh, pulsars are actually quite effective against tower ships. So what would I have done differently if, I, if my opponent had done that? Um, probably not a whole lot, honestly. It's You just have to blitz towards them when they get close enough to use their weapons. But if he had used that, he could have also launched his torpedoes, his blind ordnance into me, which would have been a little bit problematic, but the turrets, again, work pretty well against that sort of thing. So we're going to go ahead and unlock a ship here. Uh, we've got the Protector Tolku, and we've got the Protector Vorla. And the only difference is the Prow Heavy Railgun as compared to the Tolku um, having the um, Prow Twin Heavy Railgun, which is uh, 3 damage per second as compared to this one, which is... Um, Two damage per second. As far as I know, there is no other discernible difference between these vessels. Um, I guess this has a higher note because it's two shots versus one. I really don't know what the hell the point of the Viorla is, honestly. It's one point cheaper, but honestly, I don't really think that ever matters that much. They really did a balls job of uh, making these ships differentiated. So we're going to take the Tulku because it is um, two damage per second better. So, yeah.
Why the hell not? And again, we want to have that trend of taking the larger ships possible, but we're going to do the analysis that I was talking about earlier on this ship here. So it also has the gravitic launcher here. It has five damage per second because it launches five torpedoes every five or every 30 seconds uh, for 30 damage each. That's identical damage per torpedo as the Emissary Cecilia, but it also has more. So we're talking about uh, just a little bit more firepower there. We've got the heavy railgun batteries. These are actually less damage per second than we have on the Emissary Cecilia's. Uh, they have one attack each instead of two. Uh, we still have eight of them, so they still have four damage per second. Uh, we've got two of these ion cannon batteries. Each of these ion cannon batteries is one damage per second as well. So we're looking at a total so far of uh, six plus five or 11 damage per second. So it's already equal to a Cecilia. Uh, we then add the six damage per second from the uh, twin, uh, proud twin heavy railguns, which are extremely powerful weapons. Uh, these are capable of causing good criticals as well, but we're talking about another uh, 6 damage per second to the 11, so we're up to 17. And of course then we've got the uh, Ordnance Launch Bays, which have a damage attribute that's relatively difficult to calculate. Um, honestly, their utility is more important than the damage that they deal, but I think you could sort of estimate the damage that they deal to be about uh, 2 per second uh, per, so about 4 damage per second there. So these deal significantly more damage per second than the Cecilia. Um, they do come with a much, much higher price tag at 167, but that's not actually too bad. Like, they're, that's definitely a workable number of uh, hit points and uh, benefits compared to the other ones. So we're going to go ahead and take it. Um, I am going to, again, put on the repair drones, and we're going to equip this one, since it is a carrier, with the recon beacon. And this is something that you want to equip on your carriers, typically. You can also make it more of a support ship or a control ship here. I have done builds where they focus on taking Void Shield Transfer and they support the Sasias up front. And I've also taken it with the Gravity Wave Projector because the Tau ships don't necessarily like being caught at close range. But there are, of course, times where you're playing against, like, say, Eldar, where the Gravity Wave Projector is completely useless, or you're against Chaos and the Gravity Wave Projector is pretty much useless. So. Uh, it's kind of uh, a niche thing for dealing with Space Marines, Orcs, and the Imperial Navy. So we're going to go ahead and take the Recon Beacon. Nice, simple, very, very effective in a lot of situations. So uh, how does this change the way we play the fleet? It doesn't change it tremendously. Uh, what's going to be good about the Tau fleet is still going to be good with this ship. It's still better to fight it from the front. Um, the Sasias are still going to be the mainstay of our fleet in the 250-point matches, but in the slightly larger ones, we can take the Protector Tulku and it would be extremely good in those situations, and it would be a lot more damage with with a little bit more hit points there. Looking at 600 and 200, by contrast, the Sasias have 100 and 400, uh, so we're looking at 500 compared to 800. It's a 300 point increase for only a small number of points. So remember when I was talking about making sure that when you're getting extra firepower, that extra firepower is on a durable enough uh, chasis that they cannot simply focus fire it down and immediately destroy it. Um, the Tulku is a nice sort of uh, medium point of that where it is not going to immediately be destroyed by enemy fire, but at the same time, it's not. Uh, it, it's also got a lot of a lot of firepower to throw at the enemy. So it's a the very definition of a good upgrade in terms of firepower. So anyway, I hope you found this video enjoyable, and of course, as always, I hope to see you guys all next time.